If you watched the Rose Parade, you've already been to Pasadena, at least virtually. But behind the flowers and floats, this sunny city's got brains. Hey, my friends, it's Kathy, the Library Hunter. Today we're heading to Pasadena, a SoCal city that blends just the right mix of sunshine, science, and a touch of nerdy magic. I'm taking you inside Caltech, one of the most elective schools in the country, to explore its beautiful campus, its iconic library, and how this tiny academic powerhouse runs NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Yep, that JPL. If you are into space, science, or just love discovering cool places, this video is for you. JPL is federally funded by NASA, but did you know it's actually managed by Caltech? This is where you can see real-life rocket scientists walking around. You might be wondering, a place like JPL, it must be hard to get in. And you are right. However, they do host public open house events every year. These events are extremely hard to book. But don't you worry, I will share some video clips from my tour in the second half of this video. Stay tuned. Now, how much do you know about Caltech? Caltech wants you to go to school there. Really? Caltech isn't in the Ivy League. It's tiny in size. But academically, it arguably outshines many Ivies in science and engineering. Albert Einstein used to stroll around Caltech's campus and chill in Pasadena's neighborhoods like it was no big deal. No wonder the city is full of smart, artsy, and slightly eccentric energy. How many people do you know that went to Caltech? One? Zero? Yeah, I feel that. Caltech is one of the smallest top-tier research universities in the world, extremely selective. With fewer than 1,000 undergrads and around 1,300 grad students, it's tiny compared to most of its peers. But don't let the size fool you. They have a 3 to 1 student to faculty ratio. That's wild. That means students don't just sit in the giant lecture halls. They actually get to do science alongside world-class researchers. It is true that many of my heroes have taken students under their wings. Feynman, Einstein, Professor X. As I was doing background research for this video, I realized that Caltech has a ridiculous number of Nobel Prize winners. Over 40, actually. For a school this tiny, that gives it one of the highest Nobel per capita ratios in the world. Mind blown. There are two libraries on my Caltech bucket list. So let's start with their tallest building, the Robert A. Millikan Memorial Library. Back when Caltech was first being designed, the founders had always planned for a central library to anchor the campus. But it took 45 years and a generous two and a half million gift from the trustees in 1959 before the central library dream finally got the green light. Fast forward to March 1965, Caltech's then president, Lee Dubridge went before the Pasadena City Council to ask for a height variance. Why? Because the library they were about to build was going to be a nine-story tower. It's actually a vertical monument to learning. And the entire campus had been designed around the spot. Construction officially broke ground in May of that year. The design was super modern for its time. The front and back are designed with white concrete panels and the sides are covered in shiny black granite, shipped from South Africa, cut in Italy. Pretty fancy stuff for a science library. Up at the top floor of Millikan Library, I found some of the best study spots on campus. Huge windows letting great amount of natural light. What about the view? Basically, that's an overlook of the whole city and mountains. It's peaceful, bright, and kind of inspiring in that quiet sky highway. I would say all the work and efforts from decades ago to make this nine-floor tower design come true, that has totally paid off. Studying up here feels like you're literally and mentally above all the noise. And there's a nice collection of science books right on that floor too. Beyond the headlines and the rocket science, there's also a quieter, lesser-known Caltech. One where breakthroughs in biology, seismology, and environmental science have quietly changed the world. It's a place of deep focus, intense curiosity, and a surprisingly high concentration of the nation's brightest mind. 
The Minikin Library stands about 150 feet tall. It's a prominent landmark that you can see it from almost anywhere on campus. I like this lush garden with a little pond where you can see ducks, turtles, and squirrels roaming. It really adds a touch of calm and greenery around the Caltech Hall. This garden is called the Throop Memorial Garden, named after the original Throop Hall that stood here before being taken down after the 6.6 .6 San Fernando earthquake in 1971. Just across campus is the Sherman Fairchild Library, now the main branch of Caltech Library System. It's where students go when they need quiet study spots, reference help, document delivery, you name it. The second floor of the library holds the book collections, including chemistry, physics, natural history, biology, and even military science. I took the stairs up to the top floor, and wow, the reading room up there isn't the biggest I've seen, but it instantly became one of my favorites. It's bright, it's neat, and this completely caught me off guard. It's full of plants. Real, leafy, thriving, green friends, tucked into dedicated stations, lining the windows, and quietly coexisting with the students. Maybe the plants actually do grow better in a place like this. I mean, with all this brain power, all this calm, focused energy, I bet the plants want to soak it up too. And as I stood there, surrounded by sunlight and greenery and the quiet hum of minds at work, I didn't just feel calm, I felt energized. Like being in that space gently charged up my curiosity again. It reminded me why I love libraries and the little moments that make you stop and say, yes, this is it. The Sherman Fairchild Library at Caltech may not be the biggest library out there, but it's got good vibes. And honestly, that's everything. Now, as promised, here's a sneak peek behind the scenes at JPL. This public group tour is in high demand, so I'm feeling super lucky to get a ticket. NASA is the National Aeronautics Space Administration, right? It is the space agency for the U.S. government. Anything the U.S. government pays for that goes up in the space, if it doesn't belong with the military, it's going to fall under NASA. Either NASA builds it, funds it, runs it, controls it. So anything going up in space not with the military, NASA is involved. Now, NASA actually has 10 centers that are spread across the country, and um, here at JPL, we just happen to be one of those 10 centers. But most, most people tend to be familiar with the East Coast centers, places like Kennedy Space Center. Their job at the NASA Center in Florida, the Kennedy Space Center, their job is to send things to space for NASA. There's another place in Texas, very famous. It's called Johnson Space Center. Their job, train the astronauts, get them ready. Once the astronauts finally make it to space, we start sending signals back and forth, and we talk to people in space. We do all the talking with people in space, from that place in Texas, the Johnson Space Center. And that's why you notice every time astronauts in space, they talk to people on the ground, they're always referring to Houston, right? Houston this, Houston that, Houston that problem. And that's because that facility, Johnson uh, uh, Space Center, is just outside of Houston, Texas. So that's actually what they're referring to. Here in California, we're lucky because California, we have three of the 10 NASA centers here in the state. We are the only state that has that many. And here at JPL, we are one of those 10 NASA centers, but we do a different job than any of the other NASA centers. Anybody want to take a guess what you think we might do here at this NASA center? Any guesses? Yes? Build rovers. Build rovers, that's right. Have any of you guys been hearing about robots driving on Mars for the last 20 years? Yeah. If you've been hearing about uh, robots on Mars for the last 20 years, you might have been hearing about uh, Sojourner or Spirit or Opportunity, maybe Curiosity or the most recent one, Perseverance. If you've heard about any of those rovers, all of those rovers were designed, assembled, tested, built right here at JPL. In fact, on this tour today, we're going to see a full-scale model of the Perseverance rover. That's the one that landed on Mars a little over two years ago. And if you've been hearing about uh, something on Mars looking for life and stuff, most likely you've been hearing about this rover. So we'll talk more about that when we see it later on. We'll also get a chance to see the other older rover spirit and opportunity when we get to our museum. So those are the types of stuff we do here at JPL. Basically, we are the lead robotic center for NASA. We build robots. They come and see the different spacecraft uh, hanging around those different regions. Those are the spacecraft JPL has sent to go study those particular planets or regions of space. 
of all the things you guys can see over here on this side, there's a moon rock with a little pyramid there. Right now, they're working on the Europa Clipper. This is the spacecraft you heard about that's going all the way to the moon around Jupiter. But before I talk about that, I want to talk about the people in the room. So if you look towards the left center of the room, you'll notice right in front of us over here, there's a guy standing there. It looks like he's trying to take a selfie. And you might have noticed he hasn't moved since we came in. Everybody notice him? Yeah. Yes. In case you're wondering what's up with him, that's not a real person. <laughs> that's Hi Bay Bob, right? He's a resident mannequin. We have them in here because sometimes we come in, uh, nobody's working, and they want to give you an idea of the way people would be dressed if they're working, right? But you guys are lucky. You came on a good day. We have real life people doing real life stuff. If you look in the far right, you'll notice they're all dressed up just like Hi Bay Bob, covered from head to toe in a white suit. And really, this, the, the spacecraft touching it, they don't shock it, they don't break it, okay? So that's why you see that. Now, um, in case you're wondering, well, how do we get this thing in and out of the room if it's so clean? Well, if you look here left, there's a big, giant sliding garage door. Do you guys see it? Mm -hmm. And we see the most expensive mission JPL has ever done. Right now, no, most of our missions are usually in the several hundred million dollar range. If it's a big, quote unquote, Cadillac mission, that's like the Rovers or something very, very big like Cassini, they, they might cost two billion. The most expensive current missions that we have are right, right around the two billion dollar range. This one, once they get in the space, is going to be roughly about $5 billion. So it's going to be the most expensive mission we have actually sent out, right? And by the time they send it in space, when they get this thing up there and it pops open, they have the solar panels open, just like what you see in the model. From one edge of the solar panel to the other edge of the other solar panel, from edge to edge, it's, a, it's over 100 feet wide, right? Thank you for coming along with me. Thank you to San Jose State University iSchool for their continued support of the channel Library Hunter. If you know any other cool places and libraries I should visit, drop a comment down below. I'll see you next time. Bye!